Hey guys, welcome back to another video in this Flame game development series where we are creating a simple platformer using the Flame engine. So in the previous video, we created this platform class with a collision shape attached to it. And then we added some code in spawn actors method of level class to spawn these collidable platforms in the level. So the next logical step is to let the player move and jump around on these platforms. This means we'll have to implement some sort of movement and gravity system. To make it easier for me to demonstrate the effect of gravity, I'll quickly open up level 1 in Tiled and will move this player spawn point to be in the air. Now let's save this and go back to the code. So to make player collide with platforms, we'll first have to attach a collision shape to our player component. For that I'll add the hazard boxes and the collidable mix into player. Then I'll override the onload method for this class and will add a hitbox circle as the collision shape. And to see how the collision shape looks, let's set debug mode to true here. If I save and run this, you can see that the player actor has a circular hitbox around it. Now you might wonder why have I used hitbox circle instead of using a rectangle. So to make you understand this, I'll first have to explain how exactly am I planning to handle collisions in this game. So here is an exaggerated view of collision between a circle and a rectangle. And as you can see, these two shapes intersect at these two points marked in black. Now as of time of recording this video, Flame's built-in collision system can only detect such intersections and report all the intersection points. It does not perform any kind of collision resolution or physics simulation to separate the colliding objects. If you want a full-blown physics simulation, you can use the Flame Force 2D package, which integrates the famous Box 2D physics engine with Flame. But as using Box 2D is a bit involved and I want to keep this series as simple as possible, we are not going to use that. This means, once Flame informs us about collisions between any two components, We'll have to resolve that collision ourselves. So after some trial and error, I found that it is a lot easier to resolve collisions between a circle and a rectangle using some basic vector math. For example, in this diagram, if we know the center and radius of circle along with the two intersection points, we can easily calculate the depth of intersection x. Once we know that value, we can move the circle away from collision point by that amount to resolve the collision. And this is the reason why I chose hitbox circle for player component. Okay, so now let's first remove this debug mode from here cause we don't need it anymore. Next I'll add a final vector2 member in this class called velocity. And let's initialize it by vector2.0. This member will control the direction as well as the speed of player movement. Now before we do anything else, I'll quickly override the update method for this class and we'll write this very common line of code from game development which is position plus equal to velocity times delta t. Basically, this update method is invoked by flame engine multiple times per second. And the double input to this method is actually the amount of time elapsed since last call to update in seconds. So by writing this line, we are essentially following the standard equation of linear motion which is velocity equals distance covered divided by time taken to cover that distance. In other words, for every frame of the game, we are calculating the offset by which the component should be moved, and then we are adding it to the current position. So to control player's movement, we just need to change the x and y components of velocity. Ok, so to make it easier for me to control the player and record this video, I am going to implement keyboard controls for this game. I'll try to create a separate video for touchscreen controls probably at the end of the series. But for now, my focus will only be on keyboard controls. So to allow our player class to handle keyboard inputs, we'll first have to add the has keyboard handler components mix in to our game class. This lets Flame know that some of the components added under this game are expecting to receive keyboard inputs. Then next in the player.dart file, I'll add the keyboard handler mixin to player class. If you check this keyboard handler mixin, you'll find that it has only one method called onKeyEvent. 
By overriding this method, we can handle all the key inputs in our player component. So let's quickly copy and override it in our player class. Next, to indicate if player should move left or right horizontally, I'll create a new integer member called h-axis input. This integer can only have three possible values, minus 1, 0 and 1, where negative 1 means moving left, positive 1 means moving right and 0 means player is idle. Now back in onKeyEvent method, we can change the value of h-axis input based on which key is pressed. So as the very first step, I'll set h-axis input to 0 in this method. Then next, if this key press set contains the key A, I'll add negative 1 to h-axis input, else I'll add 0. Similarly, if D key is pressed, I'll add a positive 1 to h-axis input. The reason for adding these values to h-axis input instead of directly setting it to positive or negative 1 is that when both A and D keys will be pressed simultaneously, I don't want the player to move in either direction. So by adding values like this, that use case will get automatically handled. Okay, so now we have a way to detect if player wants to move left or right. But just the direction is not enough. We also need to define the speed at which player should move. So for this, I'll add a new final double member to this class called move speed. And I'll set the speed to be 200. This value is something that I have arrived after some trial and error. So if your game size and assets are different than mine, you'll probably need to find a value that suits best for your game. Anyways, now that we have this move speed and h-axis input, let's go to the update method to make the player move. So here, before updating the position, I'll set the x component of velocity as h-axis input times move speed. Now if I save this and test the game, you can see that I can move the player character left or right using the A and D keys. But right now, the player is just floating in the air. So let's see how to implement a simple gravity system. For that, I'll again create a new final double member called gravity with its value set to 10. Now back in update method, after changing the x component, I'll add gravity to y component of velocity. Doing this will gradually keep on increasing the player velocity along y direction, making it move faster and faster every frame. If I save this now, you can see that our player character starts falling downwards. But right now, the y component of velocity does not have any bounds which means it will keep on increasing indefinitely. This is not good because at very high velocities, the distance traveled per frame by the player character will be high as well. And this might cause it to tunnel through other collidable components. So to avoid this, after increasing y component of velocity by gravity, I'll clamp it between a lower and an upper limit. For upper limit, I'll use 150. This will be the max downwards velocity with which player can move. For the lower limit, I'll first create a new double member called jump speed with its value set to 320. Then in the clamp method, I'll set lower limit as negative jump speed. I'm using this negative sign here because in flame, just like many other game engines, the positive y-axis is downwards and negative y-axis is upwards. If I save this, you'll probably notice that the speed of player becomes constant after a while. Okay, so now that we have got the gravity working, let's implement some code to handle collision between player and platforms. For this, I'll first override the onCollision method. Here, you can see that we get a set of intersection points and the other collidable object as input. So first, I'll add an if check here to make sure that other object is actually a platform. If this condition is true, I'll then make sure that the number of intersection points is exactly equal to 2. With the type of collision shapes that I'm using and the way this game is designed to work, for almost all cases this condition will be true. But I'll still keep it around to avoid unnecessary failures or edge cases. So inside this if check, I'll first find out the midpoint from both the intersection points. Basically, from the previous diagram, it will be this red dot. 
Then next, I'll calculate the collision normal by subtracting the midpoint from the absolute center of player component. Again, in the diagram, it will be a vector starting at the red midpoint and ending at the center of the circle. Next, we need to calculate the separation distance by which player should be moved to resolve this collision. In the diagram, this is the x distance. And we can find this distance by subtracting the magnitude of collision normal that we just calculated from the radius of this circle. Back in code, for the radius of circle, we can use size of player component dot x divided by 2. And to get the magnitude of collision normal, I'll use collision normal dot length. Okay, now that we have the separation distance, all we have to do is move the player position by separation distance along collision normal. For this, I'll write position plus equals collision normal dot normalized and then I'll scale this normalized vector by separation distance using the scaled method. Now, if we save this and check the game, you can see that the player character actually stops falling when it hits the platform. And I can still move it on the platform using movement controls. Then next, let's add some code to allow player to jump. For this, I'll add a boolean member to player class called jump input. By default, this boolean will be set to false. Then in the onKey event method, I'll set this member to true or false depending on if space key is pressed or not. And finally, to make the player jump, I'll go to the update method. And here, before clamping the Y component of velocity, I'll check if jump input is true or not. If it is true, I'll set velocity.y to negative jump speed. And then I'll reset jump input to false. Now if I save this and go back to the game, you can see that the player character now jumps when I press spacebar. This is fine, but if I press and hold the spacebar, the player just keeps on jumping. And we don't want this. Player should be able to jump only when it is on ground. So to achieve this, I'll add one more boolean member in this player class called isOnGround with its initial value set to false. And here comes a little tricky part. We cannot set is on ground to true every time player collides with something because depending on the position of platform it can be a vertical wall or a ceiling. So to be able to say for sure if player is on ground after a collision we can use the fact that when player is on ground the collision normal will almost always be pointing upwards. So in code before changing the position in on collision method I'll normalize collision normal separately. Then I'll check if dot product of upwards direction with collision normal is greater than 0.9. Ideally, dot product of two normalized parallel vectors is 1. But this rarely holds true when dealing with floating point numbers in computers. That is why for our purposes, we'll consider the vectors to be parallel even when the dot product is above 0.9. So inside this if check, I'll just set is on ground to true. Also, when using vector to class, always try to minimize the number of unnecessary objects. Like in this case, I've created vector 2 of 0, 1 on the fly. So technically, every time on collision method gets called, a new instance of vector 2 will be created here. This can be easily avoided by creating a new vector 2 member in this class called up. Okay, now in the update method, Inside this if jump input check, I'll add a check for is on ground and will change velocity.y to negative jump speed only if is on ground is true. Once the velocity is changed, I'll set is on ground to false. And that is it. If I save this and keep holding the space key in the game, you can see that the player jumps only when it hits the ground. I'll quickly change the current level to level 2 and check if everything looks good there as well. And as you can tell, the player is now able to move and collide with all the platforms correctly. So before we end this, let's see how to make the player sprite face the correct direction while moving. For this, I'll go to the update method of player class. Here, after updating the position, I'll check if 
h axis input is less than 0 and if x component of scale is greater than 0. This basically means the player is moving towards left but the player sprite is facing right. So in this case, we can call the flip horizontally around center method. Similarly, in the else if part, I'll check if player is moving towards right and if the sprite is facing left. And in this case too, I'll call flip horizontally around center. Now let's save this and check the game. You can see that now the player sprite faces correct direction when moving left or right. And that was it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. The next one, we'll see how to make the camera follow the player and also how to stop player from going out of bounds. But anyways, if you like this video, hit that like button and maybe consider subscribing for more such content. I hope to see you in the next one.